<laughs> you know, hey, well, evening, camera's working, isn't it? All right, places, everyone. Hey, welcome to our latest yeah, conversation about public art. I'm David Reed, Executive Director of Yuba Center Arts and Culture, the local affiliate of the California Arts Council. This is the latest in a series of casual conversations we've had with community leaders on a variety of subjects that we began hosting last year. Uh, tonight's uh, subject is one that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is uh, public art. Our panel is made up of uh, individuals with a vested interest in promoting and supporting public art. Yuba Center Arts and Culture has commissioned many public murals over the past uh, five or six years, including the very popular uh, utility box murals in Yuba City. But our community still lags far behind in terms of what we think we should have and how we should prioritize public art. Before I introduce you to our star-studded lineup of guests, uh, let's start with some basics. Uh, let's just talk about public art. So what about public art and why? According to the Americans for the Arts, one of the leading uh, arts organizations in the country, uh, they had a publication in 2018 called Why Public Art Matters. Let me read this to you. Art in public spaces plays a distinguishing role in our country's history and culture. It reflects and reveals our society, enhances meaning in our civic spaces, and adds uniqueness to our communities. Public art humanizes the built environment. It provides an intersection between past, present, and future, between disciplines and ideas. Public art matters because our communities gain cultural, social, and economic value through public art. With that in mind, let's meet our special guests. Our panel consists of Marysville City Councilman and artist and designer Stuart Gilchrist. Yuba City Councilman, former Hello. mayor, Sean Harris. Wheatland City Manager, uh, Jim Goodwin. Good evening. Yuba County Supervisor, Don Blazer. Welcome. Yuba Sutter Chamber of Commerce CEO, Marnie Sanders. And muralist, Shane Grammer. Hello. So let's kick things off with a just kind of a little icebreaker question. Uh, and, you know, again, comment if you choose to. Feel free to pass on this and any other uh, questions over the course of the evening. Uh, in your opinion, what do you see as the number one arts issue in our community or in the nation? Uh, keep your answers to a minute or so, if you would. Anybody want to go first? <laughs> All right. Not everybody at once. Moving Pretty right along. Nice. <laughs> oh, come on. Why? Uh, there's got to be an arts issue. Do we have enough funding in our schools for art? No. Is there well, lots of money for public art? Don? No. I don't mind jumping in. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> this is really a difficult time to try to sort out an issue because we've been, so many issues have been in our face at the moment. So if we could roll back maybe a couple of years and not have to think about what's going on today would probably be helpful to me. So, um, and I've, I've, up till now, I haven't really seen many issues. I've seen the plus sides of art slowing you down a little bit. You know, people are so hectic, got all the thoughts going on in their heads and they come across a piece of public art and they slow up and they stop and they think for a minute. So I don't know if that was anywhere close to your question. But. That's great, no, that's perfect. Great, great point. Anyone else wanna weigh in on that one? Any arts issues that you see? Marnie. First of all, yes, rookie mistake, having my mic on while I was talking. But um, yeah, just to piggyback a little bit on what Don was saying, I just think maybe an issue um, is really the value people place on, on arts in a community and that it's a little bit lacking. And just from mm. my perspective, and when you think about the dollars that are available in communities to do development, community development, I'm sure you must feel, David, like maybe the low man on the totem pole sometimes with getting with getting funding uh, to do that. But there definitely um, is importance in having art in a community and coming from a big urban area to a smaller community like that. We can. You can see the difference in the value that's placed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Good good points. Thank you. Anybody else? Mm, I can chime um, in. I, I agree with oh, the, no. the yeah. points that were brought up. 
one of the other things is giving the artist creative control or the lack of giving artists creative control. Um, so for me as an artist, I pursue projects simply because I want to express myself as an artist. And I understand, you know, certain guidelines, you know, you, you got families and city and things like that. So non-political, all that, I completely understand, but, um, allowing artists to have creative control is something that I'd like to see more happen. Great. Good point. Good point. Anybody else? Well, I think we can't like uh, ignore maybe the fact that we are going through a time where uh, there seems to be a, a disconnect between our history and our art and the value of that history in art, in, you know, changing dynamics and culture. And, you know, there, there, there is an issue there we do have to work through in terms of uh, what is the expectation for how long art has value in a community? Does it change? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, Jim. And uh, we worked with Jim uh, as city manager in Live Oak to begin a, a major public art project there. So he uh, speaks from a perspective of great uh, experience and wisdom. So thank you. These are unusual times, as Don pointed out. We all know that. We hope we're we're coming out the other side of it as far as uh, being able to do more and more in terms of live events. We did create some murals last year with artists working, you know, by themselves, totally distanced from, from the adoring uh, community that always likes to, you know, they always draw an audience when you're out painting a big wall somewhere. But, uh, um, you know, we'll get through it. I think we're heading in the right direction. And, you know, variance aside, if we can push through that, we'll, uh, we'll be back and really get into high gear with, with more public art projects. Um, anything else on, uh, on that idea as far as uh, general arts issues? Let's, uh, let's talk about policy. Um, and before we do, um, I'll ask our technical director, Shantae, to show a couple of images of some of the art uh, public art projects we've done uh, over the last few years. Uh, for example, we had a huge project called Cover It um, Utility Box Mini Murals, um, where we took a lot of the utility boxes in Yuba City, paid artists to uh, uh, create these amazing works of art, these kind of little uh, pop-up uh, canvases all over uh, all over Yuba City. There are a couple in Marysville. And uh, that's here's looking at you, Cud. Same woman, the same artist, Karen Folk, who did the uh, roosters over at Winco. Um, these have just gotten you know so much attention uh, and have been such a, a joy for residents and visitors alike. Uh, do we have a couple of the murals, the mural projects? Mm. Yeah, great. This was uh, this was the result of what we called our mural marathon, and we had mm. a, an adjudicated process. We had five artists selected to. Uh, in a period of 48 hours, uh, each create their own individual mural panel. This was on the side of Sunny's Market in Live Oak, for those of you who know that community. And it's become a mm -hmm. rallying point. You know, bike bike groups get together and they, they meet there. And it's it's become a, a focal point and the community just absolutely loves it. So a uh, great example of uh, how uh, that kind of public art can transform a, uh, an area or at least a building. This old corrugated building's been sitting on Pennington Road forever. It's not the greatest mm -hmm. photograph, but you get a sense of uh, kind of a called Time Quake by an artist named Stefan Cellier, uh, who's now back in France. Unfortunately, he moved back, but he uh, he created this concept and then executed this mural. And it's just magnificent to kind of get a sense of of the fruit packing and whatever else went on in that uh, building over the years um, right there on Pennington. So beautiful, beautiful mural. This is another one of Stefan's uh, He's looking back. Uh, on the side of the Broadway Lounge. He took a historic photograph that we found at the Sutter County Library of, we believe, that building and kind of expanded the idea, made the car bigger, uh, wrapped it around the idea of of um, a woman maybe looking back at a father or another family member and, and put this whole uh, concept together. Um, one of the fun parts of the murals of Live Oak, and this was, um, uh, again, working with Jim when he was city manager there, was that in each of the uh, murals, we have some representation of a live oak. Uh, in this case, it's uh, it's on the key fob on the desk to the left of the woman's left hand. Uh, we also have a hidden object in each of the murals. Uh, I don't think you can see it, but it's a little tiny model of the Eiffel Tower 
sitting in the windowsill there in the middle of the image. Uh, so each of the murals in Live Oak have those two elements, uh, a live oak tree and a, and a hidden object. This is our most recent mural, 125 feet long on a wall adjoining the Buddhist church in the city of Marysville, uh, done by Madeline Templeton. We did this in collaboration with the Japanese American Citizens League. It was funded by a, a grant from the uh, California State Library. So, um, oh, yeah, okay, we can show this one now too. Not a mural, but uh, an example of how um, this is a design by Stuart uh, of the Arboga Assembly Center Park and Interpretive Center uh, here in South Yuba County, where Japanese Americans were temporarily interred in 1942 before being sent off to the uh, uh, more permanent uh, internment camps. And the idea of creating this sculptural element with the uh, silhouettes of the barracks that Stuart came up, came up with, with the cutouts of the Sutter Buttes, California and the U.S., um, suddenly art becomes uh, a marker for a historic site. So it sort of expands, I think, the value. Um, so again, with some of those examples in mind, and there are so many more, um, if we have time later, we'll show you some fantasy ideas that we have. But so who does or should decide public art and culture policy in a community and by what methods? Is this government? Is it all NGOs? Is it Arts Council, nonprofits, um, you know, who, who should have the say in, in determining public art policy? Any thoughts on that? I, the first thing that comes to my mind is it depends on where the public art is going to be. Mm -hmm. If you're on public property, then it advise the municipality versus private, would be the private property. And I think um, whether it's a, a um, say so or not, but I think it definitely needs to have some input from the Arts Council and perhaps even chamber just because those the art people they have they have the idea made their finger on the pulse in the community of what what works what doesn't work at least in theory i think we should huh? and um definitely have some input from from the council but who has the policy i think again it depends on where where the art is all right I thanks think. sean yeah. I, I think in, at the local level Local government is always going to have a very clear role in the policy. I mean, everything from zoning issues that may have an impact on what can be done, you know, to the actual investment in projects. And so regardless of whether, you know, it's on private property, public property, there, there's always a role for local government in this discussion. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, and, and I think Sh Shana touched on it, you know, the, the artist's ability to to create and, you know, we don't want to, um, we don't want to um, stifle them from being able to do that. So it, it really needs to be the community together making those decisions. And um, obviously the, you know, the cities and the counties are going to have their, their ordinances and, and, um, but it, I think it has to be the community coming together. And, and when you talk about um, capturing the history and where we're heading as a community, um, it's going to take different parts of the community to, um, to be part of that conversation. So a real collaboration, I think, is what you're, yeah. you know, where, yes. you're where you're heading. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? So David, uh, typically say murals, they, they go through some type of uh, sort of competition and approval by the Arts Council? Isn't that generally? Yeah, it depends. It depends who's who's funding. Um, there there are a number of scenarios. Uh, in the case of um, uh, Live Oak and Yuba City, where we've collaborated on a number of mural projects, uh, we make a present. We do a call to artists based on the criteria established by a committee, an ad hoc committee um, that goes out to a you know wide net of artists. Uh, through the California Arts Council and locally. Uh, we get those submissions back. We make a presentation to that committee that's been uh, put together by the, the cities. Um, finalists are chosen. Maybe there are one or two finalists if it's one particular project. Uh, maybe some adjustments to the design uh, will be requested. And then a final, uh, final decision is made. So that's that scenario. There are other times when um, uh, we're getting funding from the state directly to Yuba Sutter Arts, uh, and maybe because of the nature of the project, like the uh, the uh, Buddhist church mural, the long panorama there of the Japanese-American experience, 
um, we picked, we handpicked that artist and negotiated a fee because of her expertise in flowers and Asian figures and a couple of other criteria. So, you know, it just depends. Um, of course, we're always sensitive to community standards. You know, we're not going to do anything crazy or off the wall. And um, so, yeah, we, we help police it. Um, so right. those, are, those are a couple of uh, examples. So that's where the collaboration comes in. Once you settle on a concept idea, an artist, then you start fine tuning it. And of course you have to get the building owner's permission. You know, the guy, <laughs> the guy that owns the building <laughs> by the Buddhist church is an LA real estate investor. And that took a few rounds of emails, but super guy. And, and I'm sure Shane, you go through this all the time, right? You've got to, yeah, before you go painting somebody's building or infrastructure, you, you probably ought to have permission to do it. So, and we we're pretty good about that, providing certificates of insurance. There's a whole process, you know. It's yeah. contracts with the artists. We love to pay artists. You know, people. I think think. I think people sometimes think artists are just so desperate to go out and do something that they can just get a mural painted on their wall for free. I get calls like that. I had one today, all the time. No, these are professionals. They're you know. If you want to get a bunch of kids to paint your wall, have a great time. That's a great experience for them. But if you're looking for something a little better, uh, you got to pay them. This is why, what they've trained to do, for gosh sakes, right? Now, there's always exceptions. If you're doing something for a particular cause or organization, that's great. But, you know, generally speaking, we we pay, uh, you know, we pay artists. We love to do that. Um, I'm, I'm always intrigued, uh, and I haven't studied carefully what big cities do, but but I, I know that they often have Los Angeles. I know for sure in San Francisco, absolutely have whole, um, you know, arts departments, agencies within their city government structures. Um, so I don't know what's appropriate for us, um, for counties and cities in our community to actually adopt some kind of a formal policy. But, but I can say that, um, you know, our government uh, elected officials on this call, uh, uh, and we're working on Wheatland, but for the most part have provided, uh, you know, funding to Yuba Sutter Arts to keep us in business, to keep us going, whether it's been operational funding or project specific funding. And and uh, this group is very collaborative, uh, as are the agencies they represent. So um, we look forward to doing more with each and every one of you. Um, that that kind of segues to the next, next topic, and that's the whole economic impact. Um, what do you think as far as public art having a, an economic impact or, or an impact on economic development in the community? And I, I preach about this all the time. Uh, I know from the Arts Council perspective, specific projects aside, in the last three years, we brought about a million dollars of outside money into the community to pay salaries, to pay artists, um, all of those things that we do. Uh, and that's from outside grant money. This isn't recycled dollars within the community. We do have a membership program and we do get local sponsors, but this is, you know, this is state and federal money. So uh, any thoughts on the economic impact of public art to a, to a community, ours specifically? Well, I think David, uh, you hit the nail on the head with those things you just brought up. But I also think that if you have public art and it's, you know, tastefully done, it can even be a centerpiece to bring people that may, might make it fall down at SACOG a sense of place. Yeah. where people are going to stop and want to hang out. If they're going to hang out, they're going to at least buy coffee, et, et cetera, right? Yeah. That also, and it creates um, an environment. It creates a sense of community. What's that going to do that has, once it snowballs and synergizes, you're going to, have, you're going to attract businesses and residents all the way up and down the line. It definitely does not hurt. It's nothing but a good thing, in my opinion, for all those reasons. I, I think for most of us, when we travel, when we visit new places, uh, we, we go to look for, you know, art, whether it's in architecture, whether it's in sculpture, in murals, you know, we are looking for those interesting things that draw us. And, and that really, you know, is a very clear role of art uh, in community life, really at, at all levels. David's mentioned the Murals of Live Oak project that we collaborated on. And really there were three very specific goals that drove the council in wanting to engage in that that project and the, the first was simply to try to bring some beauty to areas of the town that were run down and the corrugated steel building that uh, david showed you that that quake uh, mural is just a great example an eyesore uh, that's no longer an eyesore uh, in the community 
Uh, another, uh, you know, key objective was just to try to celebrate the, you know, unique culture uh, in the Live Oak community and the history in the Live Oak community. And so that's why the murals, if you see all those murals, they represent different aspects of Live Oak culture from the railroad to, you know, the ethnic diversity in the community. That was the second goal. And the third one was really very specifically economic in that, you know, Live Oak is a community that's, uh, you know, has Highway 99 running right through it. Uh, for those that don't know Live Oak and just pass through it, they may think it's a community of a thousand people and don't realize that it's a community of 9,000 no, people no. off the highway. And, you know, the objective was just simply to create a reason to move people off the highway uh, to see this art. Uh, David, I don't know how it continues to progress, made a great start with the murals that were we're done. I, I hope it, it continues because the, the whole idea was to uh, build critical mass in those murals and try to accomplish in some smaller way what some very famous communities like Shamanus in British Columbia or uh, even you know town of Exeter in, in California that they've been able to achieve in terms of uh, you know creating a reason for people to visit the community. And those were some of the inspirations for the, the Murals of Live Oak project when you taught me about Chimanus and how they reinvented themselves economically. Uh, incredible, incredible story. Um, anybody else? Well, being, from, being from the chamber, you would think I'd have something to add. <laughs> you guys really did a great job of talking about it. Um, obviously, you know, a public art is is an attraction uh, for tourism I'm, I'm sure any community any community that I go to that is considered a more tourist community has a lot of art as, as part of that and and so that definitely is is a factor uh, in that and it just kind of it shows people that that we care about our community that we're invested in our community. Uh, and so it truly, truly is important and, and does contribute to our economic growth. Absolutely. And I think it's a it's a great selling point as I mean, Marnie, I know you're just so busy and working with the EDC and keeping our current businesses alive and well through these mad times. And you've done a great job there. And but as the as the growth curve starts to you know swing upward, but as you're talking to new businesses, new investors coming in, showing I think an active art and culture scene is is key as far as a quality of life issue, moving a business here and for those employees that may move to this location. Okay. And, yeah, I mean yeah. it's um, it's just kind of part of the part of the deal or, or should be right. Know. And I think we we often lament about people who you know, might work in the area, but they, they live, you know, they live right. somewhere else because we don't have the amenities and the offerings and, and arts and culture, you know, the arts is really a big piece of that puzzle. Um, and so when you think about economic development and attracting those, those folks to the community, this is, this is a big piece of that puzzle. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, part of yeah. culture and stuff. I know when Amazon did, they're looking for their, uh, their oh, one of their headquarters. That's one of the criteria is not just the basic infrastructure, police, fire, roads and water or whatnot. But if you if a community has takes the time to have public art, it shows kind of a mindset of what we feel is important and adds, I think, a lot of depth to our to our culture and our residents in the in the community. And it's just it's really a, it helps out a lot. So. Absolutely. Don. So as you know, we had a coffee house for a few years. And uh, so I was exposed to a lot between open mic, uh, live music, and displaying art. Uh, I was always amazed by the depth of musicians and artists thinking mainly in Marysville, but in the area. So it would really be nice if we could showcase that whole category, that whole uh, stuff that we have and make Marysville more of a bohemian type situation, you know. So I, I've often said, you know, the uh, you know the motto of um, Austin, Texas. Yeah. Anybody been to Austin? No, There's but I this, <laughs> go ahead. Keep keep Austin weird. Yeah, <laughs> I thought I'm hey, all for Mar it. Marysville can grab that. To your point, yeah. <laughs> well, there's so many towns that I've always considered vanilla. You know. Yeah. Marysville is definitely Rocky Road. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. I like that. That's, that's lovely. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, good stuff. 
Um, we all agree. Um, art, art and culture has a place to play in the, uh, in the world of economic development. And I think it's, it's catching on. We're working very hard at Yuba Center Arts and Culture to convince, uh, convince any non-believers or fence sitters that, you know, we just appreciate, uh, you know, being at the table for any kind of discussions around uh, economic development. So we'll do our part to uh, contribute. Um, let's talk again about the intersection of art and history. Uh, everything we've been talking about up till now has been related to kind of 2D art, if you will. Murals, utility boxes are kind of 3D, but not quite. Um, and uh, I'm thinking of our friend Chuck Smith's recent program, a uh, virtual video program called The Mystery of Marysville's Missing Monuments uh, to the City's uh, Famous Figures. Um, so what about public sculpture? Um, uh, you know, we've got some really fat, if we're just going to go with literal representations of historic figures like Mary Murphy and her sisters, the Donner Party survivors, or, you know, the incredible uh, mountaineer and, and adventurer James Beckworth, and uh, Stephen J. Field, the uh, uh, early mayor here in Marysville and uh, Supreme first Supreme Court justice, I think, from west of the Mississippi. And, and there's so many more. Um, do, they, do they need to be, what's the value of deifying may be a little strong, but uh, somehow memorializing them uh, uh, in some form, in some three-dimensional uh, uh, form? Or is it or, or do we just open it up to, you know, trying to find money to build wild abstract Kind of sculptures. There's something that could be said for that too. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, we are working with Stuart and a couple of others in the community to try to create a a, a sculpture park in Marysville uh, related to Cotton Rosser and what he's brought to the community. Uh, but it's bigger than that. There are a number of other other elements in some of the renderings that Stuart's put together. So, how do you all feel about sculpture? Because I it, correct me if I'm wrong. We don't have any in Yuba or Sutter County, and we'd sure like to, to get something going. I'm all for it, personally, David. Um, I think it'd be a great thing. If we're going to, you know, like you say, deify a specific person, we'll need some some opinions. We don't want to have an accidental whoops. We can find out as much as we can about the individual. But the abstract sculpture, and in particular, it has really caught my attention lately. My travels is kinetic sculptures. Oh, I yeah. think that could be that could be really. Uh, I'm not really sure how they did it, but there was a place where, where there's there always a bunch of fish by a river, and they made a moving sculpture. It was it looked like a water and the fish water moving around the fish. That's just one of an infinite number of examples. Yeah, the water but, agency calling. Yes, well, oh, there you go. There you well, go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think yes. there's Stay the wind, the wind and all that. <laughs> um, Mm -hmm. yeah, just to answer your question, yes, all, all in favor of that. Right time, right place, right topic. Mm -hmm. It'd be it could be really cool. So we also have some mm -hmm. historic items such as the Yuba tractor, which I believe was manufactured here in Marysville. Uh, the stamp mills, uh, some of the big gold mining equipment. Uh, you know, just digging. You know, refreshing those and having them on display. In a public place, you know, I just if you could do it safely. So when kids climb on them, they don't uh, hurt themselves. That's always an issue, right? You know, both maybe, of those have potentially moving not. through them too. <laughs> mm -hmm. It'd be a learning experience they for are. kids. <laughs> so that is kinetic. Okay, incredible. Yeah. Interactive, we call it. Yes. Yes. Kinetic yes. or interactive. Um, Shante, yeah. do, you, uh, do you have that picture of the awakening handy that I showed you? I'm talking to our... Our friend Shante, who's behind the scenes, I have one of my favorite uh, large public sculpture sculptures, which is in Washington D.C. Um, this this piece it's called the Awakening. The, the the figure appears to be emerging from the from the ground, and the far distant part of the uh, image, you can see his right foot sticking up. Uh, my kids, when they were little, used to climb on this when we lived in Maryland. Um, and it's at that location, it was right next to the National Airport. It's been moved across the Potomac River, but it's still in that general area. But talk about interactive. This was done by a sculptor named uh, Jay Seward Johnson, who has done a whole series of, of these incredible, both life-size and super life-size sculptures uh, all over the country. So um, just an example. And that, I'm telling you, on the weekends, that park is packed. 
there's really no commercial aspect to that presence of that piece, except its new location is across the river is part of a big resort complex. I don't know if they bought it or whatever, but it's on the beach on the Potomac River, and it's really an attraction to that resort facility. So uh, uh, from a public park to a, uh, a public resort, but it's, uh, it's an amazing attraction. So thank you. Um, that might be a little uh, grandiose for our uh, initial endeavors, but uh, we really want to get some 3D art going out there in public. I made an observation in, in the Chico community where uh, I served as the president and CEO of the chamber there for 12 years before getting into city management. And one of the observations was that um, as there was public discussion and debate about how much to invest in, in public art, uh, you know, at times there was con considerable discussion about, you know, what that investment was to be. Uh, but what I noticed is that once the, the discussion was over, a decision was made, and a work of art was placed in the community, uh, it quickly becomes owned by the community as a whole. And, and that, that debate that led to it seems to go away. And there's just ownership. The, the hand sculpture in downtown Chico near the Chico City Hall is a great example. Right. Where, you know, I think that is – you know, just accepted as a part of Chico uh, now. And, you know, the debate leading up to it maybe wouldn't have suggested that. Um, so it really is interesting to see how we own what we create over time. That's a good point. It's, yeah, it's a tough battle, but once you, once you get there and people really see it and experience it, I mean, you know, super controversial stuff aside, obviously there have been some pieces uh, brought forth uh, in different communities over the years that, really kind of push the envelope. Even in Sacramento, uh, Jeff Coons, uh, was it Balloon Dog? Uh, a couple of years ago, I think, yeah. down near the um, the new uh, uh, center there. The um, And it wasn't anything with the piece itself. Uh, you know, is it art? Is it kitsch? You know, there's some of that. And I, you know, I think it was it privately funded. Um, I don't remember. There might have been some some public funds involved. But yeah, but then now it's there and it's like another opportunity for selfies, right? And, and people seem to absolutely love it. But, um, you know, that's, that's part of the deal. Great, great point, Jim. I appreciate that. The, the frustrating side for a lot of Sacramento artists is I, I believe the budget was 9 million. You know, that, that, much? that kind of a budget. What was that? Was it that much? Yeah. My gosh. Oh, gee. I believe so. But that kind of a budget could have went to multiple... Right. local artists and they could have, you know, they could have created some amazing artwork. So that was a frustration that I heard locally in that area. But, I, you know, I appreciate what Sean and Jim are saying. I, you know, for the artwork, I, I would rather see contemporary modern expression um, because like, like you're sh showing in those examples that it, it changes a park, it changes a location and families want to congregate people want to be there because of uh you know how beautiful sculpture artwork can can be you know no, so absolutely. from an artist standpoint the more expressive type of work that we're allowed to do or express create um is 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 attractive to us as well you know as artists that's great thank you shane uh anybody else we all want sculpture, right? I think we can all agree on that. Now I just got to go find some money. <laughs> hit up a, hit up a few local governments for you know some contributions mm -hmm. and see what we can do. Yeah. You know, and I have to tell yeah. you, I've researched. Go ahead, Stuart. So I'm hearing a very strange alien sound in the Sounds background. Like a train. It's not in my head. <laughs> So money can come from hear anything. different places. Good, lucky you. So, I they've disappeared. The crazy Martians have flown away from my head. So, um, you know, money can be found. Um, so, for instance, a municipality can r require new development. So, developers to donate or invest a certain amount of money, a percentage in art projects. Oh, right. um, private industries can come in and sponsor art. It is imperative there is public art, 
we know that to be true. We know all, all of these things, and it definitely attracts people from out of town. Um, you mentioned Jeff Koontz, and I went to Bilbao in um, the Guggenheim mm -hmm. in Bilbao when it opened, mm -hmm. yeah. and I was concerned with how many people stood before the Jeff Koontz drooling dog, and they just wanted to see the dog. It's like, but look at the building, which was empty because it was brand new, and it was designed. That's a Frank, Frank Gary building. Frank Gehry building, Gary right? building, and yeah. it had Richard Serra architecture in it. But if you don't know who Richard Serra is, you know, the locals were like, this is an industrial town. What's happening? They weren't prepared for the, the massive groups of people that came out. It was very charming. And to so, um, and I could go on. Yeah, well, to see the Jeff Kuhn and to see this massive industrial building in the middle of um a, you know the, the industrial river and it completely transformed uh, bilbao um bilbao, Spain, and so, yeah. yeah and and you know so there you have it so and the cost of course you know the building could not have been built had it been built anywhere else i mean um because of the amount of engineering and cost and labor costs, et cetera. And so there were many different entities and agencies that took a big risk and built it, and it's well worth the excursion, and it's transformed that region of Spain. Um, but I'll never get over the Jeff Koontz, give, you, know, you know, art is subjective, and he's very successful. And I just couldn't believe how many people, and it was actually a great way to entertain people while they waited to get in. Oh, okay. um, and so there you have it. And, and yet, you know, no one would leave it. Masses, massive people. And then no one is inside other than to see the cool architecture. So well, that's maybe, um, maybe we'll start with something a little more humble here, but <laughs> yes, well, we we're, are we're many. Working. Yeah. Um, but so. yeah, to that extreme point, when you get a world-class architect and, you know, like him or not, a world-class artist and mm -hmm. millions of dollars, that's, yeah, that's another whole level. We're not there yet, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. we're going to so start. This, yeah. And, and let's look at the city of West Hollywood, for instance, that needed a lot of housing, massive housing projects were built. Yeah. However, in order to do that, they had to have public art. And so now, if you drive through West Hollywood, you see a vast amount of kinetic art sculpture and you ask yourself, is this really, is like a con, a developer picked it? Is it, is it art? I mean, again, mm. art is subjective. Yeah. And so you, you know, you really need to set policy, an appropriate policy because this artwork that's going in, it's going to be there for a long time. Um, unless it's created to resolve blight issues and then it's going to be temporary because your community is going to grow. Um, because before a community can grow, you need to eliminate the blight. And so there's that balance that we as leaders, when in you know, writing policy, you know, we have to be very cautious and careful of that um, and make sure it happens in our zoning and in our, you know, how do we fund it? We know the importance of public art and what it does to community and how many people it will draw for economic success. But how much is that going to cost? And where are we going to get the money? And, and, and you know, it's a public and We're going to collaborate. We're going to collaborate. Yeah. You and that's why you, you have to. Yeah. That we'll agency. look for the grants yeah. and, you know, keep, uh, <laughs> keep go up on. alive here in Yuba Sutter. I know. I know. You know, I have to say, talking about sculpture just makes me think of. Uh, all the controversy around the, um, the various monuments around the country that have come down recently, you know, mainly Civil War uh, Confederate generals and soldiers that have fallen from grace. And, and I don't necessarily disagree with that, you know, whether you want to characterize them as traitors or not. Uh, but it kills me when, when I see these statues coming down to, and when they're damaged, because I've, I've researched it. I know what, it go, what goes into creating these things. And I've seen a lot of those those uh, battlefields when I lived back east and, you know, Vitz yeah. Vicksburg and all over the south. And my idea would be let's get a park set up somewhere in the country for, you know, a park of fallen, you know, fallen angels or something that, mm -hmm. you know, position these uh, statues mm -hmm. all around a big park space and, uh, you know, understanding that, you know, they don't need to be glorified anymore, but let's at least preserve mm -hmm. the artwork. 
Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. that's a, a fantasy that I'll never realize, but, um, so lots of other aspects of, of public art. I, in the gosh, 15 minutes remaining here. Um, I do want to talk a little bit more about, we touched on it earlier, the whole notion of public art, uh, and a role that it plays in, um, uh, in the justice and social change movement. Um, is this something to strive for? I mean, you look at a work of art that uh, the closest we've come uh, is the, um, not that we're looking for change, but it certainly speaks to the Asian hate crimes. That big mural we created in, um, in Marysville, uh, it show, the theme I think is um, uh, coming to America, or if I'm sorry, I forget the artist's title, but the, uh, you know, showing the, um, uh, the uh, arrival of the Japanese, um, working through the, uh, the uh, Second World War issues, the internment camp experience, and coming out and, and, and going back to their farm or their business or their, their jobs, as the case may be. I mean, it's truly a, a story of survival. And you put that as a backdrop against uh, Asian hate crimes that we're all uh, reading about and seeing um, you know, on the news on a far too regular basis. Um, any place for that here? Um, looking for public art to somehow speak to justice and social change issues? Well, public, public art has spoken to that for decades and centuries, hasn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's pretty common that you, a lot of times that is the theme for the art. So whether it was the question, whether it, it should apply to our locally or not, or yeah, locally we're, you know, we skew toward, you know, we, even the arts council, as well as the community, as we all know, uh, skew to a, you know, pretty conservative side of things. And, and we are cautious. Uh, we don't want to be too edgy or too provocative, but you know, I, sometimes I think, well, how, you know, if we had the opportunity, how far do we want to push the envelope? Uh, you know, as we know, we have a, uh, we're blessed in this uh, two county community and that you're talking, this is the big city boy from LA and Washington, DC with this incredible diversity, which is not universal among our, our Northern California counties. Uh, I thought this was far more widespread, but you look at Nevada County and I, you know, the other day it's like 95% white. Uh, I had no idea, you know, whereas we have, you know, 30% Hispanic and 13% Asian and um, three and a half percent African. I mean, this incredible mix of of people and um and i just i personally love that um and i love that about this community having moved here just 12 years ago uh but you know that said there's always room for improvement for further enlightenment i think and is that something we should look to do strive to do in uh, in our future public art projects um i don't know it's just kind of an open-ended question it, it's just a thought but you know, for me, uh, and I'm going to kind of give a little story, but in 2010, I had a friend who was a missionary in Cambodia, and he was rescuing girls from the sex trade. Mm. And um, and he asked me if I'd do a mural, come out there. And I went, and it's in an area called Swai Pak, which is 30 minutes out of Phnom Penh. And there are brothels for girls down to five years old. And uh, so when I went out there to do a mural project, I was told I was going to do murals with girls that have been rescued. They're going through the restoration process. But uh, when I got out there, it's girls that are being sold that mm. I was painting with. So wow. that that project wow. kind of branded my wife and I, both of our souls. That's what I say. Yeah. And so for a little over a decade, I've been doing projects using artwork to bring awareness to child trafficking or underage trafficking. So I, I'm saying all that to say, and then also I just did a mural on Chico that was bringing awareness to that, MMIW. Yeah. Um, was that with the red handprints? The red handprint represents missing, murdered indigenous women. women. And so it's kind of a trafficking issue as well. But I'm saying all this to say, I think my thought is that if you that's it's my heart you know this is something that i feel like i need to do the rest of my life is bring awareness to these issues and there's tons of other artists that feel the way i do so it's i think it's allowing that artist to have a place um it was really hard to find the wall 
uh, took time to do that. Um, but allowing the artists that have that heart and want to, you know, that pursuit um, to, to give them an opportunity to, to do projects like this. I, I saw, I think, some photos on your Facebook page, Shane, and that was an actual um, a, a woman, a real person that you worked with as the model for that piece? Yeah, I, I was born and raised in Chico, and I graduated with a, a, a friend of mine. She's Pomo, which is Northern oh. California tribe. Yeah. So that's her daughter. We did a photo shoot, and then I had the women from, or women and men came out from the community, from the Pomo and the Machupta tribe from Chico, and they put their handprints in the large handprint. Oh, I, yes. So it was kind of making it their a collaboration very, with the communities. Very powerful. Well, yeah, we're looking at some of Shane's other images. You want to talk about your Paradise uh, Project, some of these incredible portraits that you did? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I've been doing projects like this my whole life, inner city, Brazil, Peru. I've always had a heart to use my artwork to bring hope and joy to people that are downcast and brokenhearted, no matter what that situation is. <laughs> and being born in Chico, I had about two dozen of my friends that I grew up with that lost their homes in the fire. And I honestly didn't really think anything of it because I live in LA now until I started seeing all the Facebook feeds in 2018 of what was left of my friends' homes. This mm -hmm. was the first one. So we went to, uh, that's Shane and Jennifer Edwards. And we went to the same church all through junior high and high school and Chico. And when I saw that chimney, I knew I needed to paint something on yeah. it. And uh, I painted that uh, January 1st, 2019, a little over a month after the fire. Um, but it locally became a beacon of uh, the, the locals labeled that mural beauty among the ashes. Mm. And then in that whole year, I painted on burnt cars, buildings. Yeah, I did temporary art installations like this. This is a, a large sheet of acrylic panel that I. Is that what it was? Because it, yeah, it's got that ghostly see-through. It was on actually on clear acrylic. Okay. Yeah, I did this in January because that's National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Oh. And uh, and then I had a gal that's a spoken word artist here in L.A. She overlaid. A spoken word because she actually goes in and does sting operations to rescue girls that are being trafficked and so she did wow. a spoken word on top of the video showing the production of this art installation coming together so i, I just love creating powerful images that uh make people melt <laughs> you, oh yeah and that's well and the, i'm sorry if you would should take go back to that's the uh, police officer that that was um uh, was shot in was that davis or woodland that's in arbuckle her name is natalie corona Na natalie corona right thank she you was shot in the line of duty in davis yeah. boy what a Can't beautiful kill. homage oh absolutely gorgeous so yeah you're right there you're you're right in the midst of those uh, those social you know social justice issues in so many ways you mentioned the human trafficking and that's that's a big issue here we have a a young woman here, Jenna McKay, who's um, a nationally known now speaker and trainer for police departments and other first responders. And um, that's giving me some ideas here um, Yeah, to increase awareness. It's just such a you know, huge, powerful issue. And I didn't realize you you've been doing the international work for so long either. I know you'd mentioned to me that you were heading to Guam, but that's nothing new. You've been traveling the world to do your art for a long time. Yeah, well, I... I, uh, my past life, I, I was a themed environment, so scenic artist. So okay. I worked for Walt Disney Imagineering. So my background is design, fabrication of large scale sculptures that you see in parks. And uh, we'll be in touch. Attractions. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Sculptures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but my midlife crisis is going back to my love <laughs> of street art, you know, because. Uh -huh. The theme park industry just got too businessy, and it was I wasn't creating anymore. I was directing, and and I just had to get back to street art. Well, so you're a, you're a great example of how this public art can actually have that impact on on social issues, you know, that we're all painfully aware of. Um, yeah, incredible, incredible. Um, so, what about funding of public art? We've kind of danced around it a little bit. I know budgets are tight. Everybody's struggling. Um, 
And there's no easy answer. I mean, of course, the National Endowment for the Arts is always uh, is always up for uh, up on the the auction block. And uh, last time I looked, the an their annual budget is something like 155 million dollars, which works out to somewhere uh, just under 50 cents, I think, a head per American per year. So. Um, it's you know fairly modest. Of course, we have the California Arts Council, which partially is funded by the NEA, but mostly uh, California state funded. It is an official arts agency. And and um, what about local governments? Uh, the California Arts Arts Council did a big study um, early last year to show what county funding and what uh, city funding has uh, resulted. In fact, we were we fared very well thanks to our good friends at both counties and, and uh, the cities, uh, both for general uh, operational funding that we've received and uh, also for specific arts projects like murals of Live Oak and the utility boxes in Yuba City. Um, should that be a standard operating procedure or is it just, and, and our, our funding fluctuates, um, you know, things are a little tight right now, so we're not going to do 20 more utility boxes in Yuba City this year, but we'll, you know, we'll try to do a couple. Um, any thoughts from our, you know, the, the panel here as far as, yeah, I know what you'd like to do. Is it even realistic to expect standardized funding for the arts? And I'm not talking strictly Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture, although we're, of course, willing to share the love throughout our arts organizations in the community. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop. Anybody want to comment on public funding for art? Uh, it's, sometimes, sometimes if, if an artist has a vision and they have people like you, uh, you're an amazing team that will back them up. Uh, a lot of artists don't have the, the business sense or the marketing or shaking hands and kissing babies is what I call it. You know, they, they don't have, know how to network. The uh, schmooze. But, yeah, <laughs> they don't. They usually don't know how to, they don't have those skills, but they have the creative skill. Yeah. So sometimes you can get it publicly funded or, excuse me, privately funded if the artist has a great uh, design and, and an idea that they've already pre-put together. I'll do that a lot of times. If there's something that I want to sell, yeah. uh, a style that I want to push, and I just get done finishing a project, I'll find a client that, or an owner that might pay you know $1,500 for all my materials, and I'll just go do it and wow. get it done because I want to get it up on a wall in a community and now it's in my resume. So, you know, if they can work out a pre-budget uh, and and go get it privately funded because business owners, if they are on board, like you're all on board, like your team, and they understand that this artwork is going to keep people, in, you know, paying rent and wanting their building and wanting to stay in that area, and it's a benefit to them as well. Shane, I, you're just giving me all kinds of ideas. I love the idea of kind of leading with a project as opposed to, hey, we're nice people at Yuba Sutter Arts. We've been around for 40 years. Don't you love us? Give us money. As opposed to going out and leading with a, hey, we got this concept for a sculpture or a mural. Uh, we'll put the, you know, the business aspects together, get building owner permission, do all the insurance. Can you help us fund it? And I think leading with that, uh, might be a, a new approach as I go out and present to the counties and cities here in the next uh, two months. So, absolutely, great idea. It, great it cuts idea. me. It cuts a guy like me out of the deal because I'm down south. But it usually mm -hmm. works better if you're promoting a local artist, well, an up and coming or an established artist, because then businesses feel definitely funding uh, a local artist, which makes complete sense. And we love to do that and, and totally, you know, respect that and, and work very hard to, you know, keep our local artists moving. But we do come into some projects occasionally that are on a grander scale. And, and so we put out a much wider, you know, call to artists, like one we're getting ready to do at Yuba College. It's 2,000 square feet on the wall of the main wall of the exterior wall of the, uh, the theater building, theater arts building. I mean, that's, you know, it's a pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, canvas. So... Uh, but generally speaking, yes, we uh, we work with local artists whenever we can. So, awesome. David, I think your experience locally has demonstrated that your ability to build collaboration on projects 
is where you are seeing your most success, I believe. You know, whether that's the yeah. uh, utility box project or the murals of Live Oak project, you know, it's, it's where you can see a beginning and end. You know, it doesn't look like an, an ongoing, never ending commitment of funds where you know, local government officials, selected officials have to wrestle with priorities all the time. Sure. Sometimes there's more flexibility, you know, in the budget than at others. And so that project approach has, has merit. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, I totally agree. And that's fine. We're happy working that way. We do get some um, annual operational money from, from the California Arts Council as long as we, you know, turn in our report cards and tell them all the good things we're doing. So, yeah, project-specific funding may be, may be really the approach going forward. So, hey, we're, we're down to the last couple of minutes. I promised uh, to try to keep it to an hour. Um Anybody got some final thoughts on anything, any aspect of public art that we've we've touched on or or not talked about? Oh. Are those your aliens again, Stuart? <laughs> well, I want to I want to commend the work that you're doing because one thing is clear: you are on an ongoing basis reaching out and looking for those opportunities to collaborate. And, and I believe that, you know, is why you're seeing success locally to the degree that, it, that we're experiencing it. And, you know, just continue to work in that spirit of collaboration and you know, we'll do our best at the local community level to work with you. Thank you, Jim, I appreciate that. As one of my early mentors, I, uh, I, I appreciate that very much. Yes, and I would echo what Jim said. You're doing a fantastic job at the Arts Council. And here at the Chamber, we support the work that you do, and, and we see the importance of it in the community in terms of economic development and, and supporting our overall business community, uh, attracting new business, and, and really creating that sense of community here that, that we all love. Um, I know I love to, to live, work, and play here, and, and you are adding a lot of value through the work that you're doing, so thank you. You're very kind, Marnie, thank you. And I love all the programs you put together, and every time I attend one of your webinars, it's always a, a great learning experience, so thank you. Anybody uh, I else? I, I said it a little earlier, but I know Stuart would probably completely agree with me, but from creative side, it's really, really encouraging to hear you know, civic leaders have a passion for art and, and create, you know, creating more opportunities for artists to be creative and to have a place to be creative. So thank you. I mean, it means a lot. Absolutely. That's my schmoozing. Don, thank you. Good <laughs> job. Good job, Shane. Uh, we really didn't to get to arts and education, but one time somebody made a little statement rather than three R's is the three A's, which are art, athletics, and academics. And that always kind of stuck with me. Oh, that's that, that's good. really a, a good combination. Yes. It's like STEM versus STEAM. Yeah. You know, darn it. It's a lot of STEM and we know it's important, but let's get that A in there. Come on. <laughs> I like the triple A too. That's good. I'll remember that one. Yeah. Well, gosh, um, shall we wrap it up? going about our our evenings thanks to all of our panelists for you know taking this time out of all your i know very very busy days and schedules so we'll be thinking about this conversation for uh for a long time to come and as i mentioned earlier these programs that we uh record and then uh have available on our yuba Sutter arts uh, facebook page and youtube channel definitely have a a life after and we get uh, you know usually hundreds of people that, that watch these so please We'll send you all the links, share them in your uh, in your worlds, and and uh, let's keep this conversation going, and and we'll continue to try to find grant funding for uh, for public art. Uh, I look forward to continuing to work with each and every one of you. And Shane, you're on the list here, so hopefully we can fit into your busy schedule for something in the not too distant future on on a grand scale, because you're you know you're that kind of guy. But uh, <laughs> we'll we'll keep our local artists busy as well. Thank everybody for watching that tuned in uh, live and joined us today. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture team, Abby Cecina, Sue Grau, Shantae Arroyo, who's behind the scenes uh, making the magic happen today with us, and Alex Cecina. 
and your expertise and technical skills make all of this uh, possible and easy for me. So I appreciate that. Thanks to you all. For more information about uh, any of our other upcoming 2021 programs uh, during our 40th anniversary year, hard to believe. Hopefully we can have a big uh, open house party later this year when we're all opened up. Uh, keep in touch with Yuba Sutter Arts at 530-742-ARTS or email me at david at yubasutterarts.org. Um, yubasutterarts.org is our website as well. So thanks again, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Uh, see you all soon.